Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome back into the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Cast as we are here on the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Cast Rink Take as we're here to preview the Western Conference playoff. As we're going to preview the entire series, we gave you our team projections and uh, percentages last week. Now I'm going to write down on this piece of paper like I forgot to do until after the video last week what we have for the way that we put uh, the series. So I know that for when we do series projections for the next series, who was smarter, who was dumber, or if we're both just idiots. <laughs> but let's get right into it. E-Money, first and foremost, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Let me grab this. Love hockey today today. Uh, it feels like Christmas. I'm super pumped. I wish the games were on last night and so today because I'm off work today and it just would have been great to stay up late and – get the party started but um yeah i can't really have all your cake and eat it so that's fine no i agree because i agree with that i'm busy working the royals game tonight so i'll be watching a lot of these more as the condensed game style and then i'll be able to catch a good bit of the wild blues and mainly a decent bit of probably the whole second and third of edmonton and uh the Kings, but right. it's still going to be really fun to be able to pay attention to whether it's the full game or the condensed 12-minute uh, mm -hmm. or longer games to this entire playoffs because the Stanley Cup playoffs are here. They're upon us in the most exciting time of the year. So oh, let's yeah. dive right into the series that kicks us off in the Western Conference tonight, which is the St. Louis Blues versus the Minnesota Wild. This one was interesting because <laughs> – um, I know personally, I forget what your percentages were of the dome, but I ended up giving the same percentage to each team because that's how close I thought this series was going to be. I think it was 30% to each team when we did those percentages on being able to go, go all the way. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say? I'll give it to you first for this series. Where's your lean? Um, I mean, my percentage is really almost the same. Um, I forget what exactly they were, but um, it's it's going to be ridiculously close. Out of all the first round series matchups, I think this one has the potential to be the most exciting. You have two of the hottest teams in hockey going right at it in the first round. It's just like, man, it really sucks that one of them has to get, get eliminated right off the bat. Um, both of these teams could go on deep runs. It's, it's really hard to call. Um, I like the Wilds goaltending probably like a little tiny bit more. I don't know who they're starting. I don't think they've said who's the starter between Talbot and Fleur. They might just switch them, alternate them a game. I don't I don't know what they're going to do. Um, I mean, if I were Minnesota, I would start Fleury over, over Talbot, me personally. Uh, Fleury's just been on deeper runs in the past and has the experience. Um it's really hard to say. They've been pretty quiet about it, at least from what I've been reading. The Blues are obviously going to start Husa. Bennington sucked this year. Um, who's yeah, starting I wouldn't think they would go with the veteran. That would be the odd, like a couple years ago when Riddich played better than Smith, but mm -hmm. the Flames went with Mike Smith still, and then he stepped up in the postseason and actually played well. That would be like one of those moves where right. they have to hope the latter also happens. And Bennington then yeah. steps up and starts playing. Now, I will, I will. He had a couple better games to round out the season because he ended up bringing his percentage above a 900, which it looked like he was going to have his first season. I think it would have been his right. first season that he ended below a 900. So, but like he still wasn't sharp this year at all. He needs, his, but uh, Huso was. Huso was great this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, too, like I think the Blues are a tad deeper offensively. They have more 20 goal scores. I mean, they're, they're top nine is ridiculous that first line with bitch robert thomas tarasenko and then you got the second line with sod and o'reilly and peron and then that third line barbashev shen and kairu that might even be the best third line in all of hockey if not it's pretty darn close i mean that top nine can just go on a roll at any given time they just have shooters everywhere um good playmakers all around nice step right down the middle um pretty respectable like defensive pairs too it's it's gonna it's gonna be a really close series i mean of course with the wild you can't like forget about kaprizov uh fiala has been looking pretty good too hartman's Hart been amazing yeah hartman hartman's been good zuccarello i mean but both of these teams just it, it's so close 
I mean, th- if there's any series in round one that's going to go to seven, this is the one. I think these two are just the most evenly matched out of all the teams that have been paired up in the first round. I'm going to go St. Louis in seven. I just think they're like a tad bit more experienced. The team's proven like a little bit more. I'm not sleeping on the wild by any means, but I'm going to lean Blues in seven on that one. Blues in seven. Okay. Um, I like it. I like it because I do think this one is a series that has a good chance to go seven. I do think the Blues have, I fully agree with you, some of the best, if not the best, uh, top three lines. Uh, put all together into one because when you have Braden Shen, that would be a lot of teams' second line centers as your third line. Yep. Uh, that's very helpful. Jordan Kyra would be on a lot more teams' second lines than their third line. Uh, same goes to Barbashev in his breakout year. So, uh, and also, they also have that kid, Tor- Torpachenko, who, um, who's been really good in the minors. And um, if he can kind of be one of those not weird guys because he's a very talented kid, but one of those guys that's not 100%, like didn't show he was 100% NHL ready yet, but is a big kid that boxes guys off the puck, um, then that could really help them in the playoffs as well because he is more of one of those guys. He's not a bopping point producer. He had 20 points in 42 games in the minors. He's more of one of those pound the guys off the puck, kind of make the other team's life harder, mm-hmm. and that's obviously why the Blues – probably really like him as a prospect because they love playing that style of hockey. So obviously he fits into that realm as well. Um, I think the, both of these teams have very good defenses. So it's going to be a match of like also two very good defensive systems, one run by Baruby, another run by Everson. So I think this is going to be like you said, one of the most interesting matches for that oh, reason yeah. as well. I think Huso is going to be one of the most interesting goalies to watch because Last year, they were saying they kept him in there because they love the goaltender room and how him and Bennington are boys and can kind of pick each other up. Well, last year, Bennington, in a bad season for Huso, did better and was able to pick him up some. This year, his mm-hmm. buddy picked him up as Bennington struggled huge time. So I think they actually, the Blues, were spot on about that, where I was kind of worried about that quote and thinking that might just be them trying to say the right things, but they honestly were spot on about that. So a uh, good job by them. For me, uh, I think because of the double goaltending barrel in Minnesota, that if one guy doesn't come up, another guy that was one of the, that one of the guys that have over 30 wins this season in Cam Talbot is there. Cause I agree with you from the experience, I'm probably starting flower, but then you have one of the best goalies, uh, in terms of being able to kind of just control the game as a as a backup now this season when he was able, you can't just, I understand, like I said, I come on their defensive system, but you don't get 31 wins if you also aren't freaking damn good. So uh, Talbot had a damn good season. Flurry had a honestly up and down season, but he's a more, he's a more experienced goaltender and one of my favorites. So I'm not going to knock him. It's just, that is the truth. It's not like he had the best season. He had more of a, this season, like a roll uh, up and down wavy season. But I think in the playoffs, I would go with the guy that's had the deeper runs, but because of their double barrel action in that goaltender room, that's why I also think it's going seven. I'm just have the wild because my biggest thing in the playoffs is goaltending and defense. And I think if one guy fails for the Wild, their fail safe is much more pure this year than the St. Louis Blues is because Bennington's been struggling big time. And I personally, honestly, don't dislike Jordan Bennington at all because he's someone that you can tell goes through the shit. And I have, I'm have i somebody that has the anxiety and stuff. So, like, I think he can be a good goalie again. It's just about locking his head back in and being what he can be. But I don't know if the playoffs is going to be the time he does that. That's why I'm more confident in their team and the fact that both teams have very good defenses like Jacob Middleton came over from the Sharks and that looked like it wasn't even going to be a big acquisition and then all of a sudden he's playing on the first line with Jared Spurgeon because Dean Everson found a great pairing there uh with with, uh with him because you got the big boy that can bash guys off the puck with Spurgeon who's the undrafted kid that now became a veteran a wily veteran to become a captain so like, they have all the perfect stuff there. Brodeen and Dumba is a great pairing. Kulikov and Merrill was one of the better graded uh, third pairings in the league. So I think for how deep uh, 
we have St. Louis at forward. That's how deep they're able to go more so than St. Louis at defense for the while. Plus, I believe in their double barrel goaltending. And I like the fact that they picked up a guy like Tyson Yost uh, that's very good on the defensive end and maybe in the playoffs or even step up more on the offensive end like we've seen other guys in the past do. Eric Sinek's very good on the defensive end. Like, I really like the defense of the Wilds. So that combined with their double barrel goaltending, that's why I give them the lean in seven. But now uh, we can move on <clears throat> to the team that's going to be the second uh, round of tonight's games, which is going to be the LA Kings versus Edmonton Oilers series, which I think not necessarily maybe for some from wanting to watch, but just from the interesting perspective of who's going to win this series because the Oilers might have been the better team in the regular season, obviously, but offense, 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 offense is the Edmonton Oilers where I think a lot of people might argue the Kings actually have the, not a lot of people, I think most would argue the Kings actually have the better defense. So what's your take on this series? Um, I mean, this one is intriguing in the sense that with the Kings, they're more depleted than the Oilers, where they don't have um, Dowdy for the rest of the season. And then they're also uh, missing Walker. Or Yeah, it's just those two they're missing. I had to double check. Uh, but, like, Quick is one of those guys that could potentially steal used to be. But that's also him getting older. And, like, when you get older, you start to lose your reflexes and speed and all that stuff. Well, I think – I guess goaltenders rely on reflexes more than speed, I would think, because the way the puck comes in and all that, you got to have insane reflexes to be a goaltender. Um, anyways, um, I mean, they're more – I mean, like you said, they're more defensively sound. I mean, Kopitar is an excellent defensive center. So is Deneau. But, like, them losing Dowdy – and Walker, more so Dowdy, just really hurts them. Edmonton's been on a roll lately. They come into the playoffs with some good momentum. Mike Smith's been playing well, but I just don't really trust him to take them on a deep run. I mean, can they win a series of them? Yeah, like LA's offense isn't really that that impressive. And the Oilers, as we've talked about here, their centers are like dry saddle would be a number one center on almost any other team um it's just that mcdavid's like a little bit better than him and that's just the way it is and, and news would be a second line center on most teams yeah and yeah nugent hopkins is a beast too uh i mean i like i like edmonton's forwards a lot um i mean their defensemen are like a little i mean a little shaky now if dowdy came in healthy I don't know. Maybe part of me would go Kings, possibly. I don't know. But for right now, or I guess this would be my final pick since it's starting. I'm going to go Edmonton. Um, well, Dowdy go is out for the season with his wrist. So, yeah. He's yep, gonna yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Edmonton in six. I just think that offense is going to be too much for a depleted Kings defense without their number one defenseman. I'm, I'm going Edmonton in six. I think the Oilers offense is um, a big thing for their team because obviously they're very much one of the most in the league that led to their high plus number more so than their defense offensive push pace team where the problem is in the playoffs that's not easy to do in playoff style compared to regular season where the ice is a lot more open in the regular season you're a lot more allowed to go by the rest yeah. in the postseason where you're allowed to kind of knock people off and get calls that uh, wouldn't be called like 10 years ago that they still allow in the postseason that would be called in today's regular season. So <laughs> yeah, the rules are different I think, in the postseason. <laughs> yeah, I think um I think like the the Oilers don't have the best like Pool Jarvie's a big skate. The first line's fine because you got uh guys that are strong in the puck and big skaters and Kane, Pool Jarvie and McDavid. And the second line with Hyman Dry so it was fine. Yamamoto, we'll have to see how he does in a postseason. Fogel, we'll have to see how he steps up after having a very off an inconsistent year. Nugent Hopkins was fine. Derek Ryan is what he is. He's a 35 pluser at this point. And um, their fourth line, definitely, other than the fact that McLeod seemed to develop into a young guy that's developing into a fourth line center, leaves question to be desired for me because Brass hasn't done anything since he's going to the Oilers. Uh, and then Cassian's kind of too slow for today's game, but is a very intelligent player. So is his intelligence 
and physicality going to be able to still be effective in the playoffs, or is he just not going to be able to keep up with the play like you see at times in uh, the regular season? Darnell Nurse coming back is going to be key. Mike Smith playing great is going to be key. Bouchard, I think, gets more licks on defense than he deserves because he's still 22 and growing, but he's great offensively, not great defensively yet. Uh, so that pair with Keith doesn't make the most sense. So I feel like that sets them up for some defensive liability. Uh, Kulak and Barry, that pair makes sense. CC and uh, and Nurse has actually worked really well together, and Cody CC's had a hell of a season. But my concern with the Oilers is their full their defense as a whole this year. And I know Payton on the radio that does stuff for the Oilers. Check him out. And Pirlo said the same thing when I watched their stuff a lot until recently. Woodcroft's got the most he can out of their entire team and yeah. their defensive play. It's just I feel like with the strong body team that the Kings have with the Carl Grundstrom's, the Byfields of the world, the Dustin Browns, um, the Kempe's, who's even a big guy, the Kopitar's, even out the Tassio, who's starting to use his body more since being under Todd McClellan. I honestly feel like the Kings have the advantage here just because the, the, the Oilers don't have, at least on paper, we'll see if they start to have guys do it more. The best, I think, playoff style where it's not on Woodcroft. That's more he came in late and he's got them to play, I think, a better playoff style because he's got the most out of their defensive play. But that's me saying he's got the most out of a team that was crap on defense before he came in. So, like, I'm not saying they're good defensively now. He's just got the most out of them. So I feel like the Kings have actually stayed good defensively, which has put them in the plus on the end of the season through all that adversity of the injuries. And that's why I kind of give them the nod in this series, because I think McClellan deserves praise for the coach of the year as well. And I think Pedersen had a shaky season, but his stats are deceiving because he did start to pick it up. And just because of the crap start, it was kind of like when a pitcher in baseball gets off to a really bad start, sometimes they can't pick it up enough to make their end stats the sexiest on paper. He actually wasn't as bad as the stats kind of portray. And then Pedersen, or not Pedersen, Quick, obviously has the uh, veteran experience. For me, uh, you went with the Oilers in six, uh, Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I probably would go with the Kings. I feel like this series is probably going to go... At least six. So I'll, I'll go with also the King. I'll go with the Kings in six just because I was going to say five, but I feel like the Oilers will because of their offense be able to win two. I just, I can never pick a team that's all offense for me just from the way I, I, I'm, I'm rooted yeah. in. Like if I was ever a general manager of a team, I right. would never want to run a team that was all offense because I know we're just setting our, ourselves up for freaking disaster in the playoffs. Well, yeah, because playoffs are different. Like the games just call differently, and also and I too, hope they prove me. Well, I actually don't this year because I'm rooting for the Kings. Is one of my. I'm rooting players. for the Oilers. The big reason why is because if the Oilers win and if the Flames win, we get Battle of Alberta round two. I mean, when was the last time there was a? Oh, battle I get of that, but I'm also biased. Like I want to see Dustin Brown go out with the Stanley Cup if I can't see Claude Giroux win the Stanley Cup. So that there's, there's also yeah, there's also one of those. Well, I, f- well, I figured you as a Philly fan, like most of y'all are going to root for Claude, like. Um, I mean, one of, one of my friends is, I mean, he's not like that, that into hockey, but like he likes the Flyers and like Claude was probably like his favorite player. Um, so I would imagine he'll probably watch at least some of the Panthers games and root for Claude. I mean, I'm sure all of Philly's root for Florida because of Claude. Um, but uh, anyways, Battle of Alberta round two would be just amazing. I don't think there's been a Battle of Alberta playoff series in a long, long time. And that one would be nice and violent just the way I like it. Like every game would just be complete chaos. Like they would really beat the sun out of each other. So I'm hoping we get that fingers crossed. Uh, speaking of that, do you want to just transition into uh, flames and uh, Nashville? Well, flames. And, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Dallas. sorry. Flames and Dallas. I'm sorry. Flames and Dallas. Uh, yeah. If you want to go to that one, we can the other game. I was going in the order of when they were played, but we can just skip to that one. Oh, shoot, uh, I'm sorry about that. I was just but, always talking about Ballard, uh, Ball of Alberta. I, so, the Battle of Alberta that most of us fans would want in round two, I think the Flames will hold off. Hold, I think the Flames will hold their end of the bargain for that one. I don't think Dallas has that much of a chance to beat them unless like the goaltending just gets super red hot. I like. I, how, I like have to go off. Here. 
Yeah, yeah, he would. I mean, the Flames just have... He's a great goalie, but it, it, the Flames are one of the best teams in the league. Yeah, and also, too, Jacob Mar- Markstrom's been unreal this year. He's going to get second or third in the Vesna voting, but the Flames are just loaded. I mean, you got Goodrow, you got Lindholm, you got Kachuk, uh, Machapani, and Toffoli, and then you got Blake Coleman on that third line, and uh, and I, I don't know. I just, I just think the Flames are just going to be too much. I mean... Structure is not bad either, and also too Daryl Sutter as their coach. It's it's hard it's hard to beat that with the success that he's had in the past. Uh, if any Canadian team was going to end the Canadian Stanley Cup curse, I think this year it would be the Flames. I would give them the best chance between them, the Oilers, and the Maple Leafs. Um, the Flames are just awesome. They're a really good team. Um, I personally think that. Well, I don't. I guess I don't want to dive too. I'm going to have them in the West Final just to be just to be straight up. I think they'll at least go to the Western Conference Finals. Um, Dallas should be relatively a cakewalk for them. I'm going to say Flames in five. I just think they're on another level than Dallas. Flames in Flames in five. I mean, Dallas just basically has a top line team, a couple of good defensemen. The Flames are just to me. There's just more to that team. Well, I think Dallas is actually a great defensive team. The problem is they don't have enough offense to. Yeah, they're not going to keep up. They may be able to keep up. Where I think people will probably wrongly analyze Dallas after this series because it probably will end in five with a sale. Well, their defense wasn't really the best, but it'll be more probably uh, their defense was competing hard and hard, and their offense wasn't able to keep it in the other zone enough. And then obviously you're going to get beat down and scored on at that point, which I yeah. think that's going to be the problem with Dallas, where their defense, Suter and Heiskanen is obviously, even Suter at 37, still a great defenseman. Uh, and he's still been at least very good as a defensive zone defenseman that can still pass the puck. Klingberg's obviously all offensive zone, but Issa Lindell is a very good defensive defenseman. Harley is, we'll see what he can be. He's a very young kid. Uh, see what he can be in the playoffs. Hockenpah yeah. has. Uh, his season of his career. But you hit the nail on the head. If Dallas somehow upsets in this, it's going to be because one of a guy that I know I already talked about with you on here and multiple others that almost hit 30 wins. Uh, I don't look at the big totals as much as I just look at how great a guy played and Adi played amazing. Uh, yeah. If he just plays like Thatcher Demko, and even then the Canucks didn't win that series, but maybe they could win two right. games and then it goes six. And then it becomes the Flames and six, and they're talking about a way more competitive series here. So we'll have to see. But I honestly, that's one that we kind of agree in lockstep on where yeah. uh, this far we both had different teams. That one, I would have to say, uh, Flames and five is really the best, uh, the best case uh, scenario, I think, for when it comes to Dallas, because. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope Tyler Sagan, who is a guy that I love as a player, does turn on the Jets completely and kicks behind rather than just is okay this year. And the same goes for Jamie Benn, and they actually push it so it's a great series and not a quick series because I never root for quick series. I always want each series to be great. Yeah, but I, I just don't necessarily see it. That's that. That's all. Yeah. But we'll have to see what happens. Going forward, they do have a lot of players that may, and the, and Radulov could be one of those dark horse guys that had a suckish season, but is a veteran that's been there, done that in the playoffs. Oh, that's true. That maybe that's true. Up more yeah. in the playoffs. So, like, maybe they can have something there to at least draw them to two games. But, yeah, I don't see them beating the Flames because Markstrom should be top five in Vezina. The dude almost won 40 freaking games. Where that's a and time where shutouts, too. Yeah, and led the league in shutouts. And that's when I don't even care if I. If I don't focus first and foremost ever on the win and loss stat, if you almost won forty freaking games in today's era, that's that that's when you do focus on that as well. On top of the fact that he was just a stellar netminder this year, and the Flames' defense led by Sutter, who we know is very good at running defense to offense system. Uh, that's exactly what he taught the Flames to learn how to do. And Shilaton's had a career year. With Tanev's had a career year. Zadorov's had a career year. Gabranson's had a career year. Anderson's bounced back after some slouch season, uh, after having a great start to his career. Hannafin's had a, not really a career because he's been doing good with the Flames, but he's had one of his best years. Um, and you've had guys like Adam Ruzico, who was picked 
109 in 2017 that I don't think many Flames fans saw being a part of their team yet produce great as a fourth line center. When It's kind of like when you get a coach like Sutter, we talked about this with other coaches I know when we did the Western Conference. He's one of those guys that seems to just be able to fit in, even if this guy might not be the highest skill. I was like, well, this is his strength. Let me put him here, and I'll match him perfectly with these two. So he's one of those coaches that kind of, I think, sees things as a perfect puzzle piece and goes, this guy's game Mm -hmm. will fit with this guy's game. And not everybody's able to do that. And there's no problem with that because everybody has different coaching methods. But I think Sutter's great at doing that. But I agree. It's the Flames in five. All right, so then last but not least, we got Avs and Preds. Um, I'll start this one off if you don't mind. Um, yeah, go for it. I, I don't know for sure, but I keep hearing that Soros might miss the series or at least like the first couple games. And if that happens, Nashville is screwed. You need to have your absolute best goaltender. And this is going to be another goaltender that's going to finish like top three, top five in the Vesna voting uh, conversation. I mean, we all know Shesterkin's going to win it. We've said it over and over again. But Soros had an amazing year. Yossi had an amazing year. Um, I mean, Fl- uh, Preds had some forwards that had some career years, like Duchesne and Philip Forsberg and uh, Ryan Johansson. And even the ro- their rookie, Tanner Janot, has been a beast, too. Um, they have some good defensemen, of course, but – just without that goaltender and like how good Colorado is. And I think Colorado is like starting to get healthy at the right time too. That's a big key for Colorado. Cause if I, if I remember correctly, the last few post seasons, Colorado faced some injuries. I can't remember like who was getting out off, off the top of my head. I think like McKinnon got injured in one of them. I can't, again, I can't remember, but like, I just feel like Colorado has been like knocking on the door the past couple of years. And um, they're having guys coming in at the right time. And everybody knows how good McKinnon is and Kadri. And then uh, Burakovsky there. McCarr and Taze have been the best defensive pair all season long. I think Bo and Byram could be a bit of a breakout player this playoffs, too. I wouldn't be surprised if he just, like, broke out and, like, did his yeah, thing. Yeah, his big issue was just ice time because of his head, yep. uh, his, his head issues and stuff he had to – get over yeah. and once that happened his his skill is endless it's just he couldn't be on the ice as much as they would like right and, I, and I'm, I'm saying it right now too i don't know if you did your bracket or not i uh kept tweaking mine a couple times because there's just so many teams that could win it but i have colorado winning the whole thing i i think it's their time i got them beating the rangers in the cup final um which that might be a little bit of a hot take with the rangers but there's always a dark horse that like gets in there the Rangers, I think we talked about it in the Eastern Conference video. We both, I think, called them our dark horse team. Oh, yeah, we both, we both did. Team. Yeah, we so, both I mean, did. yeah, I can see it. I don't know if I'll be picking them as I'm going to do that bracket um, this afternoon before the playoffs start, but I, I, right. I definitely could see it. Yeah, I think the first game's at 7 o'clock Eastern time, which is the Bruins and Canes. Um, but anyways, uh, to make my pick, though, I'm going to say the Abs get a sweep in here. Uh, abs in oh, four. Wow. Okay. If Soros happens to come back in that series, I might say like abs in fives, abs in six. But like from what I keep hearing, it might not. He might not even play at all, or it might be too late for him to come back. Now, if Soros was completely healthy. This would be a close series, in my opinion. I think Nashville could push them if Soros was in net because they have a good team. I like the players on the roster. You also have two of the coolest cities in the U.S. going at it as well with Nashville and then Denver. So that's a little bit interesting there. But I'm going to go abs and four. I think that's a sweep. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. It all depends when Soros comes back. Uh, um, if he comes back uh, by game three and it's like the two, kind of like similar to the Embiid effect with the Sixers in this Heat series. Yeah, because he's out the first two. Like, yeah, him. if uh, Soros ends up being out the road games and then comes back – uh, I could see if he comes back, uh, them being able to definitely ink out at least one win to make it go to five here. But I also do think David Riddich is not even the best goaltender on their squad with, uh, um, what's his name injured with UC Soros injured, who's one of the Vezina candidates. Oh, yeah, Soros is uh, a beast. Ingram is honestly better than David Riddich. <laughs> where where you're not going to start, don't get me wrong, you're not going to start Dave uh, Connor Ingram because he's a young kid. That, yeah. Is he a rookie? Be, 
thankfully did. Yeah, he still qualifies as a rookie because thankfully he got the help he needed through the NHL's assistance program, and now he's back playing mm-hmm. the game he loves. But he's still a talented kid. Like the Lightning, who are good at picking goalies, obviously, picked uh, him in the third round of 16, and then he was involved in a trade. I can't remember the exact trade. But he's been good for the Milwaukee Admirals um, in the AHL. It's just he went away for a bit and then came back, kicked behind with the Admirals again. And then Nashville in uh, a couple games didn't play great in front of him this year, but he he's still coming into his own. But yeah, uh, he did have a 906 save. He did have a 303 goals against in a couple games this year. But I wouldn't even be surprised if he ends up being the guy that ends up being in cage at some point because I could see Riddick like – Riddich was one of those guys that had a very short shelf life because when he first came up, like I mentioned it in this podcast even, with the Flames, he was actually doing good. And that was a series, I think it was maybe 18, the 18 season, mm-hmm. uh, that Mike Smith was then put in in the playoff series because he has the veteran status. Right. And then Riddich kind of hasn't been the same since then. But he, he was as an undrafted guy, and he's an undrafted guy. So, I mean, he's had a good career for that for sure. He started off good, but then just had a very short shelf life and then hasn't even been able to play to the best backup level. And that's kind of what's done him in. UC Soros has basically been their Vasilevsky that just plays pretty much every game but 15. And obviously when you have this issue and that guy goes down, well, you're kind of screwed. So, And you don't have a Brian Elliott where at least if you're Tampa, like not that you want Moose starting the playoffs, but at least you have a guy, a veteran like that. Riddich has struggled big time this year. Ingram's a young kid that you don't want to throw into the bright lights of the postseason, even though he's been very good at the AHL. It'll be interesting to see. I think if I agree with you, if Soros doesn't come back, it will be in four. But if he can come back by when they're in Nashville, I do think they're take one. And then I would have to go with it being in five. Okay. That's fair. I mean, that's, that's obviously very possible. Um, if you want to dive into the East now, I think that covers everything for the West. Well, do you the want to East hear- would do would do a separate video because I want to end it so we have. Oh my gosh, we're doing a separate. Okay, but I thank everybody for joining us for this uh, Western Conference video as we got to recap uh, where we think each team is going and analyze each team and where we think their playoff series is going to go. Hope you all have a safe day. The Stanley Cup playoffs are upon us. The most exciting time of the year. The Calder Cup playoffs is also starting tonight. And also the Kelly Cup playoffs have been upon us. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy the great playoffs.